Hello, Shirley Adams for the Sewing Connection, Series 16, Program 13. Think of the advantages of dealing only with the front panel to substitute for a blouse. A small amount of fabric will do, and you probably have a wealth of these in your stash waiting to be used. Every embellishment idea you ever had can be applied in this small area. The fact that one size fits anyone makes it a perfect gift. Any kind of fabric will do for day, for evening, for any season a few jackets to wear over them, and you can expand your wardrobe enormously. So quick you can make several of these in an evening. What are we waiting for? In series 12, I did a bunch of these in abbreviated form. Several of your letters objected to the fact that you wear your jackets open. They need to be bigger, and so these are. In series 12, those were really quite small and they needed to be worn only a jacket under a jacket that was buttoned in front. Uh, in fact, this is the way they look, this little shield pattern once it's opened up, it's doubled up here. And so these are considerably larger. By the way, this is what some of them looked like. I had probably about 30 of them then and maybe a lot more now. But uh, you might do all kinds of things like embroidering or maybe just putting some lace together or making some holiday things. Or back there with the green suit, you see that you can just wear a jacket open and instead of having a blouse, have that pretty little cutwork thing uh, snapped in the uh, neckline. So these are really useful. But what happens to those people who want to uh, wear their jackets open? The joke with Series 12 was, no matter how hot it gets, don't open your jacket or don't take it off. Well, we can open our jacket now if we just have a longer one, but here is another one of the fronts from Series 12, and you can see you can't wear a jacket open with that. So we need to do something a little bit bigger, and that we will do. Now here's the size of the one that we're going to make this time. So this, you can see, will cover the whole front. It goes all the way up to your neck, and uh, it's wide enough that your jacket can blow open a little bit, and you still have enough. There's plenty here to tuck inside your skirt or pants, and so everything will stay in place really well. And this is a great weight, as I said, to use all your embellishment ideas. Well, you've already been seeing a few of these. Now, all of these things that I'm going to show you were cut from this pattern. And you've seen a few of them in the last couple of programs. This one, for instance, last week when I was working with bias cut tubes and fast turns, I did a little passmentary, and this makes a nice one. Uh, this also was from last time, and a lot of these tubes are just hanging here, connected to the sides. At that time, I guess I didn't tell you what it was. Uh, another program, a couple before then, uh, you saw this one with the fans on it. This was cut work embroidery, and uh, here's another one that you saw at that time. But what you didn't see is the back sides of these, so let me show you the back side. Now this green one has no back side because it's a sheer fabric, and so we just left it that way. One side only, except it does have a second layer for a lining. Uh, here's one that does have a back side, and what I have on the back side is another memory card I've used to do some pretty embroidery there, just choosing whatever colors you like, whatever's going to go with what you are wearing. On the back side of this one with the fans, we have some pretty, um, shantung here, some silk shantung. Well, that goes very nicely with twin needle pin tucking. And so there are just a few scrawly lines around here using twin needles and just going in any curvy direction you want to and swirling around here and there. Pretty little thing. And uh, what I have on the back side of this is another little bit of embroidery from a memory card. Uh, just because I like the play of those pretty threads on the fabrics. And notice that all of these have snaps on the top. And notice that it is a different snap because I realized in series 12, after I got through, I had a whole box of the ones that weren't used. The other side of the snap, because I only had one part of the snap inside the suit, and then I put the other part of the snap on all the insets and I had all these extras. Well, it hit me, why don't I use the whole thing instead of having all this waste? So on all these bigger ones, I have, uh, you know how one of them juts out, the outies here and the innies where it goes in over here. 
I have one on each side. For instance, if you use all the outies on the right side and all the innies on the left side, and in your jacket, do the opposite thing uh, so that they will all connect. And then on the other side of it, I've done just the opposite. Here I have the one that would be on the left side and on the right side and so on. So they all get used up. Just make very sure when you put all these snaps on that you use the same size every time because very often these come in uh, a variety of sizes as this one did. Well, you notice I have one size gone and it's the size of three in this case. It doesn't matter. There's nothing sacred about that. But uh, whatever size you use, use it standardly throughout all of them so they are interchangeable each time. Well, I have a new one that I'm going to be doing over here that I haven't uh, shown you yet. And so let's see what this one's all about. Now this is going to be just a fun one down here. And it's using up a whole lot of scraps. Because when you have little teeny scraps of fabrics like this, this is in silks and polyesters. And when you have teeny little scraps like that, more than likely what happens is that you throw them away. What are you going to do with such little pieces? Well, if you like the way the colors go together, the thing to do is put down a piece of fusible interfacing. I have here, so I can feel it's some soft brush, uh, just any kind of thin fusible, it doesn't matter what, but you want it to remain flexible, so don't make it anything stiff, but just thin fusible. And then just take those little scraps you have and take your scissors and just cut and let them drop where they may or maybe place them uh, where you want them to be. Cut them singly, doubly, however, and scatter them around, but we want to pretty well cover this with some of these scraps and put some different colors in. And we want, this is pretty quick. You don't even have to be a sewer to do this. You just have to have some sewer scraps and you have to uh, have just a couple little scraps of fabric and an iron. Surely you have that whether you sew or not. And uh, whatever it is you like here, just put a few scraps of those down. And then after you have it all finished, cover it with some uh, tulle. This is like bridal veiling, it's black. I found if you put white tulle on it, just sort of washes it out. Black is better because it really makes that color snap. And you just put that on top and press it. Now I don't have all that interfacing covered, but it's all right. It's going to stick to the tool. It's not going to stick to the iron. And then you just press this and just go ahead and move it as you need to so that it all fuses together. And it probably will stay in here. No, you're not going to live in this thing after all. You're not going to wear it that much. It probably would stay there and be just fine. But just to make sure of it, because mine's going to take a beating. I'm going to carry all these things around to live seminars, and they're handled all the time. So I just did a whole lot of stitching, just stipple stitching back and forth. It doesn't need to take long just to hold them in place to make sure nothing comes apart. Do I have something on the other side? Of course I do. And what I have over here is just a kind of a pretty piece of fabric that I used for the backing. It has a little gold thread going through every old quarter inch or so, so it's striped. So it's kind of a tailored one. Now those of you who are really tailored people and just like to wear tailored suits, these are neat for you also because you can get your creative urge out on these little things and yet they're mostly concealed. There's just a little spot there and then you can wear your severely tailored suits over that. Now this little board that I have here, you know, equipment is everything. I like this little board when I'm doing small things, but if I'm doing large things like fusing, uh, oh, big pieces of fabric, I also like to have a great big board that I can use for something has handles, it folds up, so it's easy to just sit there when I'm not using it, but it's a big surface, about, oh, four or five times as much as an ironing board. So it's just handy to have all these things so that you're prepared for any eventuality. Let's go over to the sewing machine and I'll show you some other ideas that I have over here. Uh, one of them that I think was kind of fun is this. Now this again is one of my shopping trips and I bought a lot of this ribbon because probably the price was right is why I very often buy such big quantities as that. And so when I bought that ribbon I had no idea what I'd do with it. But what I've done with it is uh, I kind of like the different gradations as, as it goes down instead of doing even uh, rows, even distances apart. But what I've done with this is just straight stitch it on. So you simply uh, draw some lines first probably on your fabric. I draw a chalk line there with the yardstick and make sure they're all straight, uniform lines. And then cover up that chalk line by putting the ribbon down and just straight stitching it on. So that isn't much of a problem. Everyone can do that very easily. Now these are also nice projects for those of you who are relatively new to the sewing game. And uh, 
it doesn't take much time or talent to do this. Everyone can do it successfully. So it's simply sewing it on. And I have a contrasting thread here. I would, of course, if I would be doing this, use the thread that blends in so that you can't see where the stitches are. But you get the idea. You would just stitch it down one side and then stitch it down the second side so that everything is secured. And uh, it just makes a kind of a quick thing, but a pretty thing if you have a lot of ribbon of one variety. I have a second side to this one, too. They might as well be reversible unless there's a good reason for not reversing them, such as um, kind of transparent fabrics or something you wanted light and airy. But this is reversed. And what I have reversed this to do is use this. Another one of my little shopping excursions, I found a quantity of this trim that uh, I thought, well, that's going to go on something, who knows what, but eventually. So what I did is just put a row of this down. And I kind of ran out of it down there. At the bottom, it doesn't have any design, and it really doesn't matter because my waist is about here. The rest of that will be tucked in the skirt anyway, so it doesn't make any difference. But the problem was that the edge of this, of course, isn't very pretty. What are you going to do with it? Let's do a little decorative stitch is perhaps the best thing to do to attach this on. While we're talking decorative stitches, I want to show you something over here that I just love. I just got this box of the twist threads. They kind of are blending threads. There are two colors that are twisted together in all of these, in most of them anyway. And so this can do some pretty things. But also what I'm ready to do on another one of these fronts is this is striped thread. And what it does is make bars. I'm just going to set it as a bar, just do satin stitching, a wide satin stitch. And what that stripe will do is for, oh, maybe about an inch, it'll be pink. And then it turns into purple for an inch and so on. And so that's going to be pretty. The ideas for this are endless. And this little project is just the perfect place to put some of your ideas. Well, what I want to do on this is, what I did on the one I already have done, is a Greek key design. So let's go to that one. I'll have to go back to the menu because it's a higher number. And I don't have it on this particular one. So it's still ordinary sewing. It's the decorative stitches, though. And it's 131. I see up here, didn't I? Yes, right here. And it's 131 that I want. So I'll just keep progressing until I get to 131. Oh, there are so many stitches here. I could make these uh, little fronts for a long, long time before I run out of decorative stitches alone. Well, anyway, here's what I want right here. So I'm ready to do that Greek key design. And uh, they advise that I use the F foot. So I better put that on instead of the straight stitch foot that I have. Okay, here is my F foot. That's the plastic foot. And what especially this F foot does is there's a little channel underneath. Instead of it being a very flat platform, there's a little indentation underneath. And it allows for, oh, if you do a dense pattern, a dense design, or a dense uh, a decorative uh, stitch here, then it accommodates that because there's room for it under the foot. But this one is not dense. It's just a flat one. But what I'm doing is just covering the raw edge. And all you need to make sure that you do, it does its own thing. You just need to guide it enough so that this little V that's right in the center of the foot, so that that goes right down the edge of the fabric, and that will ensure that you're half off and half on the fabric that you're appliquing to it here. Now you could even fuse this on. I didn't want to do that because I want to keep these soft. I don't want to stiffen it. And even the lightest weight fusing stiffens a little bit. So I'll keep this one just soft. But uh, I did the original one, the completed one, I did in gold, in metallic thread. This one I have a light gray on. But you can see that's kind of a pretty little thing, too, and something that might be useful. And since the color of the black fabric uh, is the a different fabric completely, but since they're both black, by the time you have that little stitch going over the edge, it doesn't show at all. It doesn't even look like it's an appliqued piece of fabric. So another idea there. I have another one here that's in process that I think will be fun. And uh, what it is, is I decided I had this another shopping trip. Boy, I like to travel the country and find these pretty things everywhere. But this one is, I hope you can see it since it's black on black, but it's a big piece of braid that has been manufactured somewhere. And uh, it's all decorative cut work. Here you can see a little bit of it out at the side. And I decided that was a waste just putting it on a black panel like this, unless you can see some of it. But you have to think how much you can safely wear 
cut out. So what I've done first of all is try it on the front of me so I know exactly where it's going to be located and uh, make sure you know where your lingerie starts and all that. And then uh, when I pinned it in place here where I wanted it to be, I went ahead and did just a straight stitch. It's very easy to just follow this around and do a straight stitch as long as you do that in the needle down position. And of course, I made frequent use, constant use of that knee lift so that I could keep my hands up here but lift it with my knee and go around all that. I did a second row, then let me feel where it is. The second row goes right here through this design because right above that I want to cut it off. So I am going to cut right here where I don't want it. I'll just cut right here next to my stitching and after I have this piece all cut off then it will just be a matter of because I'm going to have a raw edge here and of course it'll ravel no matter what kind of fabric you use if it's a woven fabric. Uh, I want to get rid of the ravels so what I'll do after I have all this cut off is just put it in the machine again and do a satin stitch right here at this edge so that it's covered and so I won't have to worry about it raveling. So again a quickie. Think those of you who work and are just home in the evening and want to do some quick projects. Think of how many of these you could actually make in one evening. They are very very quick. Another one down there at the front of the table, the green one, there I have again used a twin needle and remember that those twin needles come in different widths. I have a couple of them just sitting on it. They come in as wide as, oh, I think that one I have there is about four uh, millimeters apart. Or the one next to it, the narrower one, is about two millimeters apart. And I've used the two, I believe, maybe a 1.6, uh, whatever width anyway, to make those pin tucks. So there are those pretty little pin tucks. Do a lot of rows. I'm not finished with that yet. I've only done about oh, four or five rows on each side of the buttons. And I'll probably do oh, maybe 10 rows on each side so that the whole front is all pin tucked. Now these take up very little space. But to make sure that you have enough fabric there, depending on how wide the needle is, the wider needle is going to take up more space than the narrow one. But to make sure you have enough fabric, it's not a bad idea to uh, cut out the fabric after you have it all uh, pin tucked and then cut it later or else cut it a little wider to begin with to make sure that you have plenty there. And then after I finished I sewed on those buttons and I'll sew on several more. I'm going to have a whole row of buttons. Now this is a great way to use a lot of buttons. I would never care like on a wedding gown to have a million little button loops to button there. Who has time for that? But when they are non-functioning, they make a pretty little touch there. And because they are non-functioning and because they're just going to sit there, make sure you use buttons with a hole in them so that you can just bar tack them on by machine and not have to do that by hand so that it doesn't take any time. The next one that I'm in the process of doing but haven't quite done yet is another braid I found in my uh, travels. And what this one is, well, it's a big wide embroidered piece. And you have to study things like this for a while to decide what you can do with them and how to make them work to your advantage. What I decided I would do with this one to make a whole front out of it is to put the rows together. And so there you have to consider too what's going to be the prettiest to put it together. For instance, if you just put it randomly any old place, it doesn't make much sense. It just sort of distorts it and doesn't really look nice. What I have done with this is press under a seam allowance on the raw edge. It's ravelly because it's the raw edge. But I've pressed under a seam allowance. It's oh, about 5 eighths so that the edge of it, the pressing line, the fold, comes right to the edge of the decorative work here that's already been embroidered. And uh, what I'm going to do with this then is overlap the other piece that still has its raw edge. I'll overlap this and move it along until I find a place that it does make sense, like right here. If I would put it right there, this little teardrop, this little paisley design would just continue. And this makes sense to me anyway. Whether it does to you or not, I don't know. But I kind of like the way that produces some continuity. That also makes these big uh, paisley designs right opposite each other. But anyway, I like the way these then connect by the time it's all stitched down. And how I would stitch this is to get it right in place. You might even put some scotch tape across here, some lightweight tape so it, you don't have a real heavy uh, taping on it. You might do that or you might just work with pins. But what I would want to do is work inside here so that my pins would be right on that pressed fold that I've done. And after I have them right on that crease, 
then you can simply sew right down that crease. Use that as your stitching line so that when you get through with the sewing, whoops, I didn't quite catch it. When you get through with the sewing, though, it will be just lined up the way you want to and everything will turn out perfectly. Uh, you might do more rows than that if you want to, or maybe put one of these rows in between. Do something pretty. It's amazing what you can do if you find these and uh, especially if you can find them at a good price. Get in touch with the other sewers in your area to find out where you can get such goodies. Maybe it's a manufacturer's outlet, but surely someplace you can find them. Another one I'm in the process of doing, but haven't quite yet, I just started this one, and another neat purchase I made in some uh, outlet shop. This is just a piece of black uh, crepe, and I have, uh, uh, stitched around all the edges so that I won't have any ravels. It's been surged around the edges, overcast, overlocked. And uh, the reason I did this on the bias, which is what it is, it's a big bias cut, is because it's going to be a cowl neckline to go inside one of the suits, the black suit. It'll turn that very tailored black suit into something for evening. And uh, only when it's cut on the bias does it drape nicely. If you try to drape anything on the straight, which I have it now. See how it kind of falls in little peaks and it doesn't really round out the way it should. So if you want it to drape, you always cut it on the bias because then it softly drapes. And what I'm going to do with this is just so I'll fold under the top edge so that the ugly top part is out of the way so I just have a nice fold. And then I'm going to take these beads that are on a braid and uh, it'll be a very quick job to just sew this straight across and I'll probably sew, oh, about three rows of this. I'll sew a row here and a row right under it and a third row. And these are kind of heavy. And by the time this is then snapped inside the jacket, it'll really make it droop nicely and just drape beautifully. And they won't be clanky or anything because they will be stitched down. And uh, so it's going to make a nice dressy top that will only take a few minutes. So again, so I could make easily, and so could you, a half dozen of these tops in an evening because they take so little time. Along with the decorative stitching I might do, such as I did here, the suit I'm wearing is something I wanted to show you because this was some decorative stitching I did on the last series. And I did part of it at home and I did part of it here on air. And then as I was finishing it up at home, uh, what I had done originally was this little fan that comes around out here. And I didn't have that in front of me as I was finishing the other side. And so what I did, I only had the numbers of the stitches I wanted to use. I finished this whole thing as they are all parallel. And I thought, oh no, I forgot to make them fan. And so if you do anything like this, you do have choices. Sewing always involves choices. Your choices are you can rip out all those million stitches and do it over again. Your choice maybe, not mine. You can throw it away. It's only a small piece of fabric and make another top. But what I chose to do is admit that I am the designer. I intended this all along. And to make sure people know I intended it, I did the same thing on the back of the jacket. It has an offset also design so that one side isn't the same as the other. Now, doesn't that look like it's intentional when you repeat a mistake and do it twice? There are really no mistakes. It's just a creative opportunity is what you have provided yourself with. So it's always going to be fine. One that I'm still working at and having a really good time with is a little just satin stitching. It's not uh, very creative at all. But what I've done is taken two layers of organza. And I just wanted to do something that looks a little bit like a ribbon going around. But it's going to go in a hoop. Not an automatic embroidery hoop, but just a hoop. And so this being the case, do not uh, cut out the front in advance because then you couldn't get it in the hoop. Instead, leave the fabric big. What I have done here, I don't want to experiment with the design on this fabric and then keep trying to get the chalk off and redo it. So what you can do when it's a see-through fabric is simply do whatever design you like on paper. You know, do one after another after another, just on notebook paper. And when you get something that I decided, oh, I like this idea, then you can just put it under this fabric. It is, after all, transparent. And you can simply trace this then with a chalk mark and get it to go exactly the way you like it. And then what I have been doing here and don't have finished is satin stitching it. 
and I did this satin stitch just this way in the hoop just these two layers of fabric and it's not enough you don't know until you try these things what really is going to work well for you and this simply wasn't enough uh, it, those stitches don't look wonderful they're just satin stitches but they aren't as pretty as they ought to be so I am going over those that's easy enough to do you can always correct it by doing a second round there I'm going to go over this but this time I'm going to put uh, some stabilizer behind it and then I will clamp it in the hoop and then it will do a really good job. Now this doesn't uh, provide a whole lot of space in this hoop, so of course you have to move it every once in a while. So here I have it in here with the, st whoops, I didn't push it in completely, but you need to get a good amount of weight there and push it in, and then it's very easy to just satin stitch those two rows. And after they are all satin stitched, then I've cut very carefully away one side of it. Now remember as I was doing some cut work embroidery a couple of shows ago, what I did was first of all just straight stitch. And so that's what I've done here. You learn by everything you do. Here I have stitched just about three rows because this is really Ravelry fabric, this organza. And I've stitched that and that holds it in place while you cut away what you do not want, just the one layer and I left the second layer, and then do the satin stitching over that and it's going to work out beautifully. Well, sewing is really the most joyful of hobbies and I can't get enough of it. This was the last show in series 16 and per usual I'm off traveling to live seminars where I can meet my sewing friends you wonderful viewers in person. That's really exciting and one of the most fun aspects of what I do. Hundreds of ideas are already whirling through my mind and I can't wait to get to my sewing room to get going. Every day's a party when you love what you do. In my travels I'll also pick up many new inspirations that will influence my next round of sewing. Nothing is ever static. There's a constant flow of interaction and through this I really keep busily connected to all of you sewers. Now if you're not a sewer, but thinking you might like to be, look into it. Classes are probably available right in your community, so find them at your sewing machine or fabric shops, sewing guilds, cultivate some sewing friends, for you'll have a lot to share. Do yourself a favor by every day, even if only for a small stretch of time, pursue something that really brings you great pleasure. Shirley Adams here for The Sewing Connection, hoping you'll stay healthy, be happy, and enjoy. <laughs>